You're listening to Trek FM. Hi, my name is Vaughn Armstrong. I've played more characters in the Star Trek universe than anybody, and I was Admiral Forrest. You are listening to Trek FM. The journey to the journey. Hello, everybody at home, and welcome. This is to the journey. To, to the, the journey. journey. My name is Charlene Schmidt, and with me, as always, is Tristan Riddell. Tristan, I am very excited for this episode. Yeah, we say it every week, but it's absolutely true. We have a pretty cool topic, I think. And uh, this is in sort of relation to our, I don't know, we like to do our writer's room episodes where we take a blank whiteboard and make a whole new story just on the spot. We love doing that. And this is sort of an offshoot of that where today we are going to envision ourselves if we actually had been in the Voyager writer's room during the airing with the people who created the show. Yes, it was it was a topic that kind of just came to us, you know, just came out of nowhere, like not that long ago, we were just like, hey, let's do that. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's just one of those ideas where you're like, that would be very interesting. But before we get into that, I do, I, I was looking at my calendar just a moment ago, and I realized we are stupid close to Star Trek Las Vegas. Oh, haha. <laughs> Yes. To be honest, I, I've been so busy in my personal life that I've not even had Vegas on my radar, but you are so right. It is coming right up, and we are both going to be there. Both of us. How amazing is that? Yeah, we're going to meet for the first time in <laughs> almost four years of podcasting. We've been doing this virtually the whole time. I can't wait to give you that big bear hug with Matt Hansen. <laughs> I know. I was, I was talking with my wife, aka the girl, the other day. And I was just I was just talking about it. I, I was just talking about Vegas, and I said I was like, I am so incredibly stoked about Vegas. I, I I just cannot wait. And like I'll talk about it with friends and family, and they'll say, Hey, what are you doing this summer? And I say, I'm going to a Star Trek convention, you know, in Vegas. And uh, <laughs> they'll say like, Oh, are you? yeah. At first they'll say nerd, then they'll say, Are you excited to meet Shatner and and you know like and Stewart and everything like that? And I said I was like, Yeah, yeah, I am. But then I start getting emotional, and I'm like, "Yeah, but I'm gonna meet Char. I'm gonna meet Hanson. You know, like I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna yep. get a photo with both of them. I'm gonna frame it and put it on my desk." <laughs> Hell yeah, me too. Yeah, that's the stuff that I am really going for at this point. I've been yeah. to Star Trek Las Vegas a couple of times, and it is absolutely fun. The panels are great. It's awesome to see the actors, the producers, you name it. But this time. I am all in it for the other people that I'm going to see. All of our Trek FM cohorts, you, Hanson, the people that I know who are at Vegas every single year. It's like a big family reunion, and I just can't wait for that. Yeah, it's it's this big, for me, I mean, you, you've met way more people than I have, but for me, it's like a family reunion, but with people you've never met before. <laughs> yes, it's the people you talk to on Twitter all the time, and all you the meet time. them in person, yes. It's going to be so strange because I just, I know that, um, like, I'm, I'm going to see someone and I'm going to, I'm going to go like, oh my God, it's Enterprise Extra O2. You know, like, <laughs> yes, it's just like, yes. like, actually, my name is Jim. You can call me Jim. And I'm sure that people are going to go to me and say like, <laughs> are you the insane Robin? I go, yes, I am. Yeah, that's right. And I, I just have to interject with what you're saying. Your name is Jim. I do that to Jim Morehouse all the time. I like actually the <laughs> the reason why I came like came up with that name is because Enterprise Extra. It's not O2 or anything. It's inter at yeah. Enterprise Extra. He goes to Vegas all the time. He's a yes. big Star Trek nerd. He was a guy who won a charity contest and actually had a walk on role of Enterprise. Yep. We should mention that he recently wrote an article for TrekNews.net about his experience. So give that a look uh, or look that yeah. up. Yeah. Google that J Jim Morehouse. Enterprise Extra, look for that article. Uh, he's a great guy. We actually used to work for the same company. Oh, uh, no kidding? I didn't know that. Is that how you know each other? That's how we know each other, yeah. Aha! I worked in the Chicago office. He worked in the LA office. And then um, we had an LA event that the Chicago people went to, and we were working out of his office. And 
we found out that we had a love of Star Trek, and it was just really funny. Like, uh, uh, we just immediately found out, and he, he, he uh, how I found out um, was like I was in his office, and I saw some I saw some DVDs on his desk, and I'm like, what What are those? Those are labeled Enterprise. I was like, are you a Star Trek fan? He goes, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. He hands <laughs> me a DVD, and he says, here's the here's the clips that I'm in. In the show, <laughs> nice. And he, he had it pre-made in several on his desk to hand them out. Yeah, that's... this guy is super proud of his stint on on Enterprise, and he should be. Yeah, honestly, if I would have had the same opportunity he did, I might very well have done the same things. And that's the thing is like he's the only individual that I talk to regularly on Twitter and online, and are Star Trek friends with, and that who I've met in person. And so I, like, even people listening to this episode, if you're going to be at Star Trek Las Vegas, I am super excited. We are super excited to see you guys come and find us and say, hey, I'm a To The Journey listener. Yeah. What I've done in the past that tends to work is I will have people tag me on Twitter, just send me an at reply and say, hey, uh, I'm at the Kate Mulgrew panel in the, the main theater. Come find me by the refreshment table at the end. And it almost always has success so Mm -hmm. i I honestly think that might be the best way just yeah when if and when you're there can't wait to meet all of you because so many of us are going to be there this year so many it's gonna be incredible it's gonna be insane yeah although i i gotta say last year was pretty freaking cool with the voyager anniversary i okay it's funny that you say that because i i'm sad that i missed previous years but i'm glad that this is the year that i'm going because it's the 50th but what I really want to do is I want to find uh, – I, I, there's a specific photo where the uh, where Jerry Ryan, um, Roxanne Dawson, and Kate Mulgrew are all in these blue dresses together. Okay. Yeah. I know that photo. And, yeah. I want to get – I want to find that photo, and I want to get all three of them to sign it. That is my goal mm. for Vegas is to okay. make that happen. I think you can make that happen. You just have to find a high-res photo, which might be your most difficult task of this whole thing, is finding high resolution of that photo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, I I haven't, uh, I've bought tickets for the day, uh, but I haven't bought any tickets for specific things to do. Now, is that too early for that? Or, like, I'm such a noob when it comes to Vegas, because, like, can I, like, buy the signatures while I'm there? Um, You know... I would recommend if you know that you want somebody's autograph or a photo op with them, get it now. They should be available. Well, they should be available now. And if they're not available now, keep an eye out because they're adding all the time as they figure out the schedules for all of the guests. So the moment it becomes available, snag it because there are a limited number of those things. Okay. I forgot about that. Yeah. So I definitely want to do that. I might do that tonight actually, because yeah, if I could get those three people's signature, I will be a happy camper and I will say <laughs> successful Vegas when nice. it comes to merchandise. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Yeah. That should be great. Okay. Yeah. Well, as excited as we are for Vegas, I'm also excited for talking about the writer's room because this was my dream when I was, uh, when it was 1995 and I was 13 years old, this is where I wanted to be in life. I wanted to be in the Star Trek writer's room. I wanted to be writing Star Trek and we're going to envision that today. Yes, we are. It is it, it is a dream that many of us have had and very few have experienced. And it's it's one of those things where you literally dream about it. You lay in bed and you think about... Like, there's a couple things that Star Trek fans dream of. And it's one of them is definitely, of course, being on the bridge, just living in that world, obviously. Sure. Uh, and yeah. an- another one is being a part of the actual making of the show where people... So many times we're, you know, like we're couch managers where we want like as we're watching a show that you know that you've seen an episode where you're like well they should have done this they should have done that they should have had the character do this you know it's just human nature and so so many of us and me included have we do it all the time on this show when we do our rewrites it's a segment on this freaking show where we (laughs) rewrite the episode right so yeah and yeah. We have the gift of hindsight. We've had 20 years to critique an episode and right. determine better ways. But in the trenches, when you were actually in it and you have to produce 26 episodes a year, um, you know, 
that's a lot of pressure and that's a lot of freaking hard work. It really is. It really is. And like, I have massive amount of respect for anyone in any kind of writer's room because it's, it's gotta be daunting pressure to be creative on command. Absolutely. And to create at such a high standard that's going to get you uh, either critical acclaim and praise or is going to pull the show off of the TV screens and you're suddenly out of work and you've got to find somewhere else to go. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, there, there's there's probably a lot of turnaround in the writer's room because I, I know individuals who have been in writer's rooms and they haven't if if they haven't contributed in a while, they get asked to leave. Right. Oh, yeah. It's a very cutthroat business. I mean, that's just kind of Hollywood in a nutshell. And I say that even as somebody who has not officially worked in Hollywood. And yet this is something that I think if you just read between the lines enough, you see it happen all the time. That's the way entertainment yes. works. Everybody wants to be in it or anybody who's creative at least has a, a desire to work in it in some capacity. But the reality is, is it's a very grueling, very cutthroat, very... Uh, I don't know what I want to say. It's it's a very uh, high and low, up and down business, sort of like a roller coaster ride. Things can be either really good for you or they can be really bad. Now, the beauty of Star Trek was that they knew after the success of Next Generation that their spinoff shows, with the exception of Enterprise, were going to have seven seasons. Like, that was almost guaranteed and that was practically unheard of. Was that a guarantee? I mean, because... Pretty they much. Went I mean, they they went through, you know, renewals just like everybody else did. Yes, but it was one of the most stable franchises out there at the time. Okay. And so okay. maybe it, it wasn't a practical guarantee, but it, I mean, everybody was saying, hey, we're going to have seven years of DS9. We're going to have seven years of Voyager. And they were saying that in season one. That just doesn't happen with, I would say, 99.9% .9 of shows. So the stability of Star Trek was a very rare thing indeed. Now that said, on Voyager, we did see turnaround a lot. We saw mm -hmm. Jerry Taylor uh, step down from, well, she was a, a creator down to an executive producer, down to a cre creative consultant, leaving room for Brandon Braga to take the, the show running duties, eventually leaving room for Kenneth Biller and Brian Fuller to take more prominent roles, bringing in other writers, so we did see some of that happen on Voyager as things I think maybe got just a little more, I don't know, a little more hectic and a little harder to make happen mm -hmm. because they'd been producing so many hours of Star Trek at that point where it was getting harder and harder to create original ideas and execute them properly, especially on a network like UPN where you have suits to answer to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh I guess we should get down to it. We should get down to the nitty gritty. So are you yes. and I in the room together or are we in it individually or does it matter? <laughs> you know, that's so funny is I've been thinking about that since we decided on this topic. And I thought, ah, you know what? We are a really good writing team. We ought to be together. And I had this vision that we are like the Brian Fuller writing team where we managed to be the Wonderkin spec script writers who managed to get in the room, get our foot in the door. And now we have basically, we're, we bought and sold a story. And so we are now in the rotation where we can pitch regularly okay. and participate in a little more story breaking, that sort of thing. That's how I sort of envision our place here. You know, okay, we're not regular cool. staff writers, but we are, we are in. All right. So we, so we, we're wunderkins. Like I'm in middle school, you're in high school. And, totally, totally. And we submitted a co-authored script, you know, like written yeah. by Charlene Schmidt and Tristan Riddell. And um, so now we're in the regular rotation. Written on 1996 uh, internet connections. Yes. Yeah. Mine is on l loose leaf paper. With, you know, like by, with, <laughs> with colored pencil. Mm. I always wrote in pen myself, but I wrote in notebooks <laughs> constantly back then myself. And then I would type them out. So what? Okay, so it say that we have influence now. Like we have decision-making, not decision, ultimate decision-making power, but we have influence over how characters are treated, where they go. What would you do differently? Like who's the first character that pops into your brain where you're like, you know what? I would take this person in a different direction. 
Ooh, I have two strong candidates right away. But one thing that I think we need to address is maybe when in the course of the show we have managed to break in. Season three. You're yeah, holding up three fingers? I'm, okay. That's what I'm season thinking. Three. Season three. Okay, that's a great thing because I had kind of, as I was mapping this out in my head, I had different course of actions thought out for seasons one through three and then four through seven because as the gears shift things change a lot and so mm -hmm. as uh as one of the people influencing the direction of the show i would want to do very different things with the latter seasons as opposed to the former seasons so former seasons it's season three jerry taylor is in charge that's great i love her i think right. we would work well together i really want to give ensign kim some life <laughs> really bad why what makes you say that i because we're three seasons in and we know quite very little about him at this point we had non sequitur in season two which was kind of a good alternate universe episode about him he's died or almost died a few times great he's friends with tom paris also great uh, and aside from things like uh, remembering being in his mother's room and playing the clarinet, we don't know a whole lot about him and we really need to build his character. He's three years in on this ship. He should be getting a little more comfortable. He is no longer the green ensign. The boy needs to grow up and he needs to do it properly. That's what I would want to do. Okay, so you've established why you want to do, but what would you have him do? What would you have him go through? Mm. Yes, now this is the trickier part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got to face some sort of challenge to where he is going to grow, right? And, you know, with Voyager, especially at this juncture being so episodic, that makes it a little more difficult. You almost have to give him an experience that's practically self-contained. Kind of like mm -hmm. how the shoot was, where Tom and Harry were in prison together and had a, a very solidifying moment in their friendship. Harry's going to have to have almost like his inner light experience in one episode <laughs> that's going to transform him profoundly. What that is, ah, boy, I, I didn't think that far, that far through. And well, this it doesn't is... have to be specific, I guess. You know, like you could just say, you know, like, it, so you, you want to learn, like, it sounds like you want to learn more about his backstory. Like, do you want to learn more about his backstory or more learn, learn more about his character? As in, when I, I say character, as in his character characteristics. I want to learn more about his character. I want to know what Harry Kim is really made of. I want to know just how strong he is. Because I feel like he could have been. It just didn't end up working out that way. But there was definitely the potential. Because we know he's a smart guy. And he's a good guy. He's a wonderful friend. Uh, but yeah, he needs to go through a little something in order to have some personal growth and development. You know what? I might actually argue with you on this one. I feel like what? we might we I feel like we might not be giving Harry enough credit here because I think there's always room to grow. I I can't argue with that. I, I I'd love to learn more about his backstory and and li I'd like to see his metal tested more. I'm not arguing with that. But when you look at some of the some of the best Harry Kim episodes that we've gotten, we have the shoot, which which definitely shows his strength and resolve. And yes, that's true. That is true. We, there was that, we, and it was very good. We have the episode where he falls in love, and uh, what's it, what's the disease? We have the episode disease. That's not we, happened yet, though, in season. Well, three. I know, I know, I know. But what I'm what I'm what I'm saying is is that is that it does happen. But you are are I guess let's cl clarify that you want it to happen sooner. Absolutely. I want to oh, okay. see right. more than just okay. Harry standing on the bridge saying, shields are down. Or I can't do okay. that, Captain. Because that's what the poor guy gets relegated to, sort of like Chakotay, where he's stuck on the bridge all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, then we are in 100% agreement. Okay. I, I, I missed that part. So, yes, that's good. That's good. You just gave me another idea, by the way. If... Uh, if we don't want something profound to maybe like traumatize Harry and prompt growth that way, because let's face it, he does go through a lot of trauma. It's just, you know, we could put him in a relationship, like a real 
real, strong, and long-term, serious relationship. He could be sort of like the, not, well, I mean, okay, we had Tom and Bellana, and that eventually mm-hmm. happened in season three, uh, leading on into the future seasons. But what if, I don't know, I don't want to steal their thunder, but what if Harry enters into a really solid relationship himself? I like that idea. I think it should be, that's good, that's good. Like, get like he's like the um, make him the anti Jordy, you know, where where they they have <laughs> kind of the same characteristics, you know, but Jordy just couldn't make it happen with a woman, right? And no holograms, and no holograms. Yeah, I feel like there's very similar paths that they've been on, right? I mean, he's been really unlucky up to this point, and he continues yeah. to be unlucky. And I would love it. I would. It, the more I think about this idea, the more that I love it. I think it would be a really interesting growth to see him emotionally move on from Libby, although not losing hope of getting home, just realizing that logically it makes sense to live his life in the here and now and be happy with the person that he's going to have. I think what we should do as writers, we should say, hey, okay, we should do this for season three because later on we could do something cool with this character, like in season six or season seven. We should have him fall in love and have a relationship with a Lindsay Ballard. <laughs> you love her, don't you? I I love the idea of her. Ah, okay, yeah. Her, I don't particularly like the actress that much. Um, I I the episode was okay. I thought it was a good premise, but executed a little poorly. Uh, mm-hmm. but they 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 showed such a deep connection between Harry and Lindsay is it made me sad that we didn't see that. I I want to see that. And so with hindsight, I mean, I, I'm totally. just throwing out this. Yeah, this is complete hindsight. But even if we didn't know this, this is the type of character that I would describe for Harry. Someone competent, someone uh, technical, a side character, does not have to be a main character, completely side character where maybe we only see her, you know, like when... Uh, it's relationship episodes or when it's a Harry episode or something like that. Um, and then maybe then she could grow a little bit larger to be like the Garrick, you know, of, uh, of Voyager sure. or something like that. Uh-huh. But yeah, yeah. Have a, have a, have a relationship, a strong relationship with a non main character and show us what that's like Sh- or show us what casual dating is like. Cause we didn't, we never really got that. Not really. And I would love to think that Jerry Taylor would approve of this idea and, absolutely be in favor of it because it embraces so much of what the Voyager journey is about. All they have is each other. This is about embracing that family aspect, coming together, all that whole thing. And yeah, Harry, just he needs so much more. And so I would like to think that Jerry Taylor would get the okay to make this happen in a script. Mm-hmm. somewhere down the line even if it's a b plot it doesn't even have to be a major turning point where it is the focus of a story let's just watch it happen mm-hmm. you know it doesn't even have to be dramatic because let's face it i mean not every relationship is full of tv-ish drama it's true it's true yeah you're not right. every baby is born in a catastrophe not every marriage proposal is in the face of uh life-threatening circumstances you know all those tropes no, what if it's just a really nice, normal relationship for once? Some people are going to say that's boring, but in a way, it might be refreshing if done properly and subtly. I, I think you're absolutely right because I'm, my wife and I are doing a rewatch of Gilmore Girls right now. Mm-hmm. And because of the, the new episodes that are going to be, the new TV movies that are going to be coming out this fall. Right. And there are certain times where, like, for years... For four or five years, we were waiting for Luke and Lorelai, the female protagonist and the male protagonist, to get together. They finally get together, and then they break them up. And then at the last second, they get them back together. And it's just like these showrunners don't want us to have any joy. And they just need to fill things with drama. So let's create a relationship where, like, sure, they have their tough times, but it's not up and down like showrunners love to do to us. Totally. I am 100% with you there. That's perfect. Okay, so you've, we talked about Harry. The first character that came to my mind was Chakotay. He was also on my list, but I really wanted to 
give Harry some love, but I would love to give Chakotay some love too. And the only reason why he took a step down from me was because they did sort of try to give him something in season two. And then, I don't know, by season three, they just, I don't know. Had they given up on him at that point? We definitely do need to give Chakotay some love. So that's the other thing I would tell Jerry Taylor is don't let this guy get bored. Yeah, yeah. I think after Seven of Nine, uh, he started having less and less to do. Uh, well, so a I lot think... of characters did, unfortunately, <laughs> which is what I would have been fighting for in the four through seven arc is as much as we needed to develop Seven of Nine, we cannot forget about Bellana, Harry, Chakotay, Tom, Neelix, you name it. Pretty much yeah. everybody but Janeway Seven and the Doctor. <laughs> this is prime time to save Chakotay, to make sure that his character stays complex and stays interesting. And so... We need to rescue him! What I would do specifically is have get him out there more. You know, like, if you think mm -hmm. about TNG and Deep Space Nine, Riker and Kira were always out on missions. They were always out. They were the, the first ones on the front lines. They were meeting new species. They were having adventures. They were, uh, you know, like, they were the leaders. They were the on leaders. the front lines. Yeah, they were leaders of the front line. And I feel like in the Delta Quadrant, I mean, I know... I know we needed to build up Janeway as much as possible because of the position that she was in out, out in the world outside of Trek. But right. I really yes. feel like Chakotay was very interesting when he was meeting new people, meeting new species. And I really would love to see him be that Riker-esque character who is is a little brash but understanding at the same time. And... You know, I want to see his temper come out a bit more. You know, like I want to, I want to see him <laughs> where he's that angry warrior. You know, like have that come back. Yeah. You know, like ha have him. I, I want to see him witness something that is eerily similar to what the Maquis were going through in the Alpha Quadrant. Ooh. In the Delta Quadrant. Yeah. We could even, I don't know. They. I think maybe they half-heartedly tried to do this in uh, the episode Nemesis where... He ends with that great line of, I wish it was as easy to stop hating as it was to start because he gets involved in that conflict. But what if they did it like a mini arc or even a two-parter where he really sees a mirror yeah. of what he went through in the Maquis and can't help but sympathize and it creates a lot of friction, a lot of problems. Yeah, it's specifically between Janeway and Chakotay where... Yes, that's what I want to. As much as I love the relationship, I wanted this relationship to have a little bit more of an up and down. Yes, and you know why? Because those two, when they conflict, are at their best when they ultimately come to back together. You know, they kind of have yeah. to like break it apart at first and fight it out. But then when they come back together, they are stronger as a team because they complement each other so well. Chakotay and Janeway come from very different ideas and backgrounds, and Chakotay is very good for Janeway because he makes her see beyond her own little box, which she desperately needs. They're very good for one another, and uh, I want to bring up a little... Uh, I just want to mention on the Babel conference, there was a conversation about Scorpion and uh, how that, like, that was such a central thing to... Uh, that story, the Janeway and Chakotay conflict, and part of why it was such a good story. Because we needed, we need more of that. We need more of them clashing and fighting things out. And you know what? They're both stronger for it in the end, usually. Yes, I, I, think, I think that's true. But most of the time, what we've seen is knockdown dragouts between yeah. Chakotay and Janeway, where it's been like, they're just like volcanoes, where it just, it, they're never just like tense with each other. It's always just like, oh, my God, I can't believe you betrayed me. You know, like, what are you doing? You know, just like sh and shouting matches. And then it's gone for an episode. I would love to see where they just disagree more, where uh -huh. it's just, you know, Chakotay's like, you know what? You know, Captain, I, I think this is the wrong move. And she's like, well, I'm the captain. And that's how it's going to be. Well, here's the thing, though, is a lot of times that's the way it usually does go is Chakotay will bring up an idea or somebody will bring up an idea. And she says, oh, that's great. But I've already made my decision. I want to see more of the clashing conflict where they both have very valid points and there's no right answer, like in Scorpion. And ultimately, yes, it is Janeway's call, but it is a little more fiery. It's Yes, it, that, that's how it usually is, but it's usually in a group dynamic. Like it, It's usually 
where they're they're all around the table and they all come up with different suggestions and Jane was like, okay, I, I've already made my decision. But I want to see that interpersonal one-on-one disagreements that aren't necessarily the I'm going to turn in my badge and my gun kind of arguments. Oh, okay. In that case, I am absolutely with you. And we cannot forget, season three is the height of the Janeway and Chakotay dynamic. This kind of conflict and resolution building is only going to solidify them as a command team more and more, which I feel at this particular point, especially, how can you not, uh, if done properly, (laughs) how can you not just love them both for it? You know, if you solidify that position for them, make them better. I, I see absolutely nowhere to go but up with this idea. Yeah, that's what I would do. Is I, I would I would give Chicote more to do, put him on the front lines more. Um, I would explore the um, the archaeologist side of him a bit more, and right. like make make that a recurring thing where you know like Tom has his 20th century and his cars and everything like that. Let's you know do the Chicote archaeology thing, but not make it <laughs> like Picard's archaeology because. With this one, you know, like they're in the Delta Quadrant, they're going to meet new species constantly, and they have, but let them meet even f- more former civilizations where he has to, dis- you know, use his skills as an archaeologist to make discoveries and save the day. You know, like let's do that yeah. more and more. Totally, that in its, in and of itself may be a really solid episode right there. Yeah. So that's what I would so, do with those two. Th- right. Those, and if those we're going to give Chicote a hobby, let's give him a freaking hobby and have him stick to it. And that that's the thing. Stick to it. <laughs> like, not this, like, oh, let's give him boxing as a hobby. And let's right. make er- early Mars missions as his hobby. You're like, n- come on. I mean, I, I know several people have a lot of very different uh, hobbies. I mean, like, you and I have many hobbies. But at the same time, when you're watching a TV show, let's simplify it. Let's keep it keep it low. Well, right, we're not going to learn every little aspect of this person's character. However, we can explore what we do know and then branch out from there. But to do that, you have to make the uh, the foundation. So as people who are in the writer's room and potentially helping determine the outcome of the show and possibly writing some of these episodes ourselves, we're not the only people who are in the room, obviously. And so one thing that's occurred to me is there's going to be people who vastly disagree with these ideas are going to shoot us down. Who do you think might be the person or people who tear us down as the noobs in the writer's room and say, that's a horrible idea. It sucks. We need to do this instead. Well, I think we all know who we're thinking about or at least who's the first person that <laughs> popped into our heads and just that just would put be, the name out there yeah that would be brandon braga i mean i yep. have i have nothing but respect for the man because I likewise mean, he gave us he gave us some of the best television um in in star trek and there but i feel like there's a reason why both you and i chose season three and that's because jerry taylor was still on board you and i love jerry taylor as a storyteller and Right. I think the, that's the individual that we would really want to latch on to. And also, I mean, we're both feminists and there are certain ideals that weren't really perpetuated uh, later on and that were focused on early in this in the series, but not necessarily later in the series. And and also on top of that, uh, you know, Braga was all about Jerry Ryan and for obvious mm-hmm. reasons, and, and by <laughs> extension, her character, Seven of Nine. I mean, like, we saw a huge boom in Seven of Nine, and we should have, because she's a very interesting character. She deserves a spotlight, but not at the sacrifice of other characters. And I feel like right. when Jerry was on board, there was much more of a balance uh, amongst the characters. Yes, and you know what? I think in a way that's something that I really appreciate about the earlier seasons, and I do feel that her presence did have an impact on that and also i think it's important to re-note because we said it way earlier in the episode but let's say it again she was one of the creators of voyager she gets it you know she kind of knows what this show like what she wanted this show to be and you might disagree with her vision or you might not but she steered it in a very certain way 
And uh, yeah, I think you and I are both more on board with that than maybe we even realize, which is why we gravitated towards season three, as you were saying. Yeah, and yeah. she was much more, she's a very character-driven episode writer. When she was writing TNG, she did a lot of character pieces. Whereas I would say um, Brennan Braga is a little more action-oriented and he likes to go for what he calls the weird, the weird shit stories, which are great and we need those too. But mm -hmm. I think overall... Jerry Taylor's vision is a little more of the embodiment of what Star Trek is and needs to be. Just my humble opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't really think about that until we started talking about it. And I think it's true. I, th I think that's why we gravitate towards Jerry. And also, we are huge Mosaic fans. And so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Pathways, which she wrote both of, yes. Yeah, exactly. And so, Take and a I drink, was even... everybody. We haven't mentioned the books in a long time. <laughs> And of course, I was thinking about Pathways when we were talking about Harry, because we learn a lot about Harry and his academy days and um, mm -hmm. his family, the situation he ran into with his roommate, you know, like that was an interesting <laughs> story. And uh -huh. yeah, it's just I mean, she, so it like her writing mosaics and her writing Pathways shows how much she cares about these characters and how much she loves these characters and how invested she is in their backstory. And that's why she has character-driven stories and you get the weird shit stories later on. Right. Yes, yes. Yes, Jerry Taylor was very invested in Voyager since she was there from day one. It, was, it wasn't just her baby, but it was very much her baby. It was the legacy that she really left behind. I mean, if she wants to be remembered for anything, I think it's the fact that she was one of the co-creators of Voyager. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. That's yeah. how I feel. So, okay. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but let we've talked about some character development. We, we haven't really spoken that much about big picture stuff. Is there any big no. picture stuff that you would change? Like any, any, like, w would you want them to focus on a different alien? Would you want like a, I think we would really pitch a, a season long enemy. And you know what? Since they kind of came off of that with the Kazon uh, culminating with the season three premiere, I have a feeling that's going to get shot down by the other writers. I think I think you and I would pitch it and say, no, we can do it differently, guys. We could do it in a way that makes sense and that, that would make sense to span thousands of light years. Uh, but they would go, no, we failed with the Kazon. Shut up. Right. Yeah, exactly. Michael Piller really tried with that. He pushed for it. It was not well received and we've got to move on. However, we did have one other better villain in the Delta Quadrant at this point. What if we had one last hash out with the Vidians before we finally for sure left their space? Yeah, I think I, you even mentioned that. You, you've mentioned that before. And I think that's a great idea. <laughs> I, I, think. I have. <laughs> <laughs> That would be an epic note to end on. Like we're we're leaving Vidya in space, and like maybe that's you know Neelix can can come in and say like yeah like we we're almost outside of their borders, but they're constantly pushing their borders further and further because they're looking for new, you know like organ donors or something like that, and <laughs> forced organ donors. And uh, yeah, not willing, no. And so maybe this is a way where they they come out with a plan to get outside of a Dian space, kind of like they did with Borg space, but better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or at least different, yeah. Yeah, we're like, imagine it's something like Deadlock, but where they don't have to sacrifice, them, sacrifice themselves in order to win. Sure, I mean, I could see this being a really good two-parter, if nothing else. But you gotta lose some people. Ooh, anybody we know? Nah, it's still Star Trek. <laughs> It's true, and I don't know, that does seem to kind of fall right in line with season three. We're not going to lose anybody important yet. This isn't Game of Thrones, for crying out loud. I know, right? I wonder yeah. if that's going to be a thing in Star Trek 2017. Like, hopefully they won't mm. be killing off characters willy-nilly, like in Game of Thrones or Walking Dead or anything like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's still got to be Star Trek, and it's got to be mm -hmm. hopeful and... I have a feeling I would I would say more often than not we're going to have our core cast unscathed. But don't quote me on that because I'm not on the writing staff of that show. Yeah. <laughs> we're only on this hypothetical writing staff right now. That's as good as it gets for us. So who the heck knows? But if I were them, I would not kill off a ton of people. No. No. 
Oh, okay, so we've dealt with a few character moments, talked about the difference differences between 1 through 3 and 4 through 7 because of Jerry Taylor and the lack of Jerry Taylor. We also talked about uh, some how we uh, what ideas uh, would get shot down and uh, what uh, characters we like what aliens we would really like to focus on before their exit. Uh, a I little think bit. I think we have a lot more to talk about but not today. Yeah, we do. I think we could take this on in another part. The one last thing that I want to leave off on, I think, before we finally wrap up, is that season three was kind of the strange new world season where it was sort of the alien of the week. We didn't have a whole lot of recurring villains. We had kind of one-offs where we were exploring space and we were showing that, yes, they were traveling through because we were seeing new species all the time. And that was something that uh, I did. I think they did do well and would mm-hmm. definitely want to encourage that as a writer for that season and keep it up. Again, that's a Jerry Taylor idea, and she really pushed for it and made it happen, and I would be on board with her. I know it sounds like we're sucking up a lot to Jerry Taylor. Maybe we are. <laughs> but, I mean, if she is our boss. It's true. Yeah, this, this episode has uh, turned into a, a Jerry Taylor love fest, and uh, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. And that's the title of the show. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, we got to leave off for now, but I could see us revisiting this topic and maybe undergoing more hypotheticals too. Maybe we do tackle seasons four through seven and see how that writer's room is and how do mm-hmm. we fit in there that way. But until we do that, this is not the only topic that we've been talking about on Trek FM this week. Here's a glimpse at what else is happening on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. 50 years, there's been something to carry it this far. In that yeah. vein of, hey, it's our it's our generation or our era's mythic heroes that we can look up to. Do we dare put that in something that's lasted as long as, you know, literary-wise Shakespeare and some of the other myths of, of, you know, the ancients that have found a purpose and a use that still speak to people? Women at Warp. <laughs> Admiral Alan Alda came to visit Captain Coretta Scott King. <laughs> meanwhile, morale officer Beyonce is uh, trying to deal with her new Weasley sweater. And <laughs> they're all partying at the first contact party. Stage nine, a podcast about the people who make Star Trek. I'm going to take a moment just to say stage nine here on the Trek FM network is the only show I'm aware of where you're going to hear somebody get this upset about camera technology. And that's what else is happening on Trek.FM. And none of it is possible without the help of our fantastic patrons on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Trek FM. Consider becoming a monthly subscriber. It helps us out tremendously because we are a listener supported network. All of our funds come from listeners who appreciate what we do. And so if uh, you have not uh, considered doing this yourself, please do so if you want to keep the Trek Talk coming to you every single day of the week. Now, on TTJ, we have several associate producers that we need to thank. And so those lovely people are Kenneth Tripp, Jamie Deuce, Bruce Lish, Dante Hopkins, Brian Beliso, and Kay Janeway. Thank you all so much for supporting TTJ. We love you for it. Another way you can help us is by writing us a review on iTunes. That helps other people find the podcast, gives us better ratings, yada yada. The iTunes algorithms are a mystery to us. All we know is that they work, and the more reviews we have, the better off we are. So if you haven't written us a review yet, you know what to do, and we will give you a shout out on the show when we see your review come in. One more thing for contact. Uh, Due to things happening in my life, I have not been on Facebook very much, hardly like at all and I know people have been tagging me for things and I'm sorry I've not gotten to them so I appreciate it and maybe I'll eventually get to it but for right now I'm on sabbatical and Tristan I know you're not even on Facebook so the best way to contact us is through Twitter my handle is oh the profanity my handle is at the insane Robin and you can also contact us via email by going to the website and going to trick.fm slash contact right so if you really really want to get through to us that is the absolute best way to do it just wanted to kind of reiterate that a little bit. I'm not ignoring you on purpose. I just, I can't. <laughs> so we've wrapped this one up. 
Next week, we have something in store for you. What is that going to be, Tristan? We are doing an episode rewrite. This is one of my favorite things to do for this show. We're going to be taking an episode of Voyager. Not a, an insanely good one, not an insanely bad one. Just one that we think could be a little bit better, and we're going to punch it up. But the thing is, you're going to have to wait two weeks to find out what episode it is because sadly we're going to have to take a bye next week so you guys are going to be without your ttj next week but we will be back the week after next and you're going to love it though because we're going to give you a great show but you'll find out then that's right so until then everybody hang with us and this has been to the journey to, to the, the journey, journey.